Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about sex, but in particular, human reproduction and how it relates to our demand for food. Now, we all need food to survive, regardless of age, gender, or creed. And the more of us there are, the greater the demand for food. So picture yourself in a life raft in the Pacific Ocean. There's several survivors on board. They all speak different languages. And they range in age from the elderly to an infant. There's just a few containers of food and some bottles of water on board. And periodically, they pick up more survivors. So what's going on here? Well, the demand for food is increasing as the survivors accumulate. But at the same time, the supply is diminishing from consumption. So what should be done here? Should everyone on board get the same amount of food? Or should the injured or the sick or the elderly get more than the others? So these are difficult questions. So I work at the University of Arizona. And I teach a class for the Honors College called Human Reproduction and the Environment. And I'd like to share with you some perspectives that I've gained from teaching this class. So, the topics for this talk will be the following. I'll be talking to you about trends of population in developed versus developing countries, the characteristics that help define those trends, the current lack of sustainable food production, and then finally, possible solutions that can address this widening gap between the demand and the supply. Now, some have talked about the crisis of food production. In fact, the cover issue of the May National Geographic uh, magazine is, is about that very topic. And others have talked about the lack of sustainable population growth. But I believe that both must be addressed in order to achieve some kind of reconciliation in the widening gap between the two. Now, after this talk, whether you agree or disagree with what I've said, I'd like you to take what I've said in the context of your own life and start a conversation with others about it. Now, we'd all agree that there are more people now than ever before in the history of our planet. And as the population grows, so does the demand for food. But are we all evenly distributed around the planet? Well, no. In developed countries, in fact, the average family size is decreasing. But these are the families with the easiest and the most access to food. In developing countries, it's a different story. The average family size is much bigger. And land degradation has had a significant input on food production. I'd like to share with you some stats that I put together. So this is based on 2013 census data. These are age population pyramids. So they show the age population distribution for individual countries. And on the left, you see Nigeria, a developing country. And on the right, you see that of the United States. And in the next slide, you see a similar comparison between Afghanistan and Germany. Now, notice that in the developed countries, the, the prop, population age distribution is fairly uniform with the pronounced bulge of the baby boomer generation. But notice how in the developing countries, the majority of the population is in the younger age classes. And in fact, in Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, over half of the population is under the age of 15. Now, this trend has been occurring for decades, as shown here by Nigeria from 1980 to 2010, except now it's even more pronounced. Now, childhood mortality, perceived or otherwise, goes a long way to explain this. And the lack of health care means that parents want more children to care for them when they're elderly. Now, it's not that families are having more children now. It's that they're having the same number of children as their parents and their grandparents did. Except now, there's more of them having those children. And how many children? Well, the average number of children right now in Nigeria is six, with often as many as 10. So 
that leads me to ask, why is it in developed countries that the average family size is smaller? Well, prosperous economy, a developed infrastructure, and relatively easy access to food and health care and other resources goes far to explain this. And so, despite the tax credits given in the United States per number of children, the average family size has decreased as the people in this country recognize the direct connection between a standard of living and the number of children. And to maintain that standard of living, the average family size is maintained so that both parents work, and that's harder to do with a larger family. So that leads me to supply, my next topic. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, 99.7% of the food that we eat is derived from soil. Yet, land degradation directly related to food production has been occurring worldwide and costs billions of dollars. And in the United States alone, the average annual cost, well, it's not average, but it ranges, but it's the annual cost is between nine and $44 billion in lost revenue, damages, and efforts to reverse that erosion. Now let's face it, food production is destructive to the environment. Natural vegetation is removed, the surface of the land is recontoured, and the very structure of the soil is destroyed from tillage to promote planting and soil fertility. Wind and water erosion take their toll as well. And each year, an area of land that could be used to grow plants for food is lost to soil erosion. And that amounts to an area the size of the state of Iowa each year. So even if that food is produced, where does it end up? Well, let me ask you this. Your last trip to the grocery store, how much food did you buy? And what decisions led you to purchase that food? And then finally, how much of that food that you purchased went out eaten? Now, according to a recent USDA study in 2010, 31% of the food produced in the United States went uneaten. It was lost due to rot or contamination at the source. Retailers rejected it due to blemishes or an unsuitable color. And the rest was purchased by consumers but went uneaten. And according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, this trend continues all over the world with a third of the food produced going uneaten. So what can be done to reduce the demand for this food? Well, broadly speaking, two approaches are possible. The top-down approach has governments and or religions determining how many children should be born in each household either explicitly by law, as in the case of China, for example, or implicitly by control of access to resources, such as food, certainly, but also education and health care, birth control measures. And other incentives include tax breaks, subsidies for sterilization, or a campaign by the media. So how effective is this top-down approach? Well, for example, in 2012, the president of Nigeria decreed to his nation that they should only have as many children as they could afford. And he appointed a national population commission to determine the feasibility of making birth control a law. This was met with widespread protests all over the country for religious reasons, but also a suspicion that the government had the resources but was sequestering them. So what happened here? Well, the government saw a direct connection between families, number of children, and poverty. But the lay public didn't subscribe to this notion and felt that the resources were there but just not available. So a bottom-up approach is needed as well. And in that case, the bottom-up approach means that families determine their family size based on individual economics. Okay, these include access to food but also education and especially for women. Because you see, in developing countries, women who are uneducated tend to be subservient to men. And the number of children in a household tends to be determined based on what the man wants. Providing education to women in these countries increases their knowledge base, but also their confidence. Because in a classroom, 
women have the same obligations and responsibilities as men. And upon graduation, they can join the workforce and increase their personal prosperity, but also national prosperity. So with bottlenecks from production to consumption, whether it be for food or education, a decentralized approach would be very effective. In the case of education, that means providing opportunities to learn. Distance learning opportunities, for example, providing computers, internet access, and classes that you can take online. And with a third of the food produced all over the planet going wasted, having more and smaller farms would improve access to food, reduce packaging and transport costs, and provide jobs. And could also reduce the footprint on the landscape, promoting land degradation. But you see, a decentralized approach is, is very effective here, but it's not the only answer. Because in the time of famine, for example, having a centralized resource for food and the ability to distribute that would be vital. Similarly, universal health care would be very important as well to provide access to medicines and vaccines to limit the spread of infectious diseases and promote the health of a population. And then finally, providing education. And the incentives to pursue that education would form a bridge of common purpose between a people and its government. Well, you know, it's easy to take what I've said as abstract concepts. You know, these are things you'd see in a textbook something that happens to other people. That is until you go hungry or you have children to feed and you don't have the food to feed them. And let me ask you, what decisions should you make in determining how many children you should have? Is it based on what your parents tell you, what your friends tell you, what your religion tells you, or what your government tells you? I would suggest consider those things, but also consider the world around you and supply and demand. Now, it's in our nature to be reactive. But one of the things that distinguishes people from much of the world around them is the ability to be consciously proactive, to anticipate events before they occur and to take appropriate steps. In this case, to be reactive in the face of a widening gap between the population demand for food and the limited supply means to be reactive in terms of warfare, famine, and disease. But to be proactive means to address both of these explicitly and to find some kind of approach that reconciles the widening gap between the two. And just finally, a reminder. Sex is a powerful motivator for us. It affects our appearance, influences our behavior, men are thinking, or <laughs> lack thereof. But just remember, sex is also used for reproduction. Thank you.